Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be in the world. My name is Dipali Duan, and I am the Dan Mishra Curator of South Asian Art and Culture at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I'm delighted you can join us for today's program, Ram Connects Beyond Photography, featuring the work of internationally acclaimed artist, Dianita Singh, and joining us in the discussion is Dr. Kudri Jain from the University of Toronto, both of whom are with us today. Before we begin, and even though we are meeting here virtually, I'd like to acknowledge that the Royal Ontario Museum sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. I personally want to acknowledge the communities who have historically lived on and cared for this land that I live and work on and who still do so today. I also want to acknowledge the legacies of colonialism, violence and extraction that have and continue to challenge that relationship to the land. My own journey of learning with respect sincerity and appreciation is one that is ongoing and evolving. I also want to acknowledge the devastating humanitarian crisis that is unfolding in India right now as subsequent waves of COVID and its variants are causing widespread suffering and high death rates across the subcontinent. This is certainly at the forefront of our minds our guest, Dianita Singh, is at home in Delhi right now, and both Kudri and I have family and friends who have been directly impacted. Our hearts and minds are with them right now, and it is hard to know, at least sitting from over here in Canada, what we can do to help. The three of us had a little huddle about whether to continue with this program and came to the conclusion that in times of such crisis, especially one that has been intensified due to structural failures and systemic inequalities. Opportunities to nurture new ways of thinking and being in the world are more important than ever before. So we move forward as best we can. I will also be posting in the chat several organizations that are providing aid to India in this crisis that you can consider supporting. They have been taken from a list circulated by the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. So now on with today's program. I am very happy to welcome Dianita Singh and Dr. Kudri Jain. Um, I'd like to introduce them both now. Renowned for the evocative arrangements of black and white images that push the boundaries of photographic practice, Dianita Singh is one of the most recognized contemporary artists in the world today. Her work has been collected by the Museum of Modern Art, New York City, the Tate in London, and the National Gallery of Art in Ottawa. But more importantly, I think for her, it sits in the homes of many people, friends, friends of friends, and people who now have one of her portable museums who can curate their own shows. Dianita uh, Singh's art uses photography to reflect and expand on the ways in which we relate to photographic images. Her recent works, drawn from her extensive photographic archive, allow her images to be endlessly edited, sequenced, and displayed. In this way, her photographs are in interconnected bodies of work, replete with both poetic and narrative possibilities. Through publishing, she extends her experiments on alternative forms of producing and viewing photographs. I also want to welcome Dr. Kadri Jain, who is the Associate Professor of Indian Visual Culture and Contemporary Art at the University of Toronto. Her research focuses on images at their intersections between art, religion, politics, and vernacular business cultures in India. She has written about print culture, some might call calendar art, a popular art form depicting Hindu gods and goddesses among other subjects, and how these images are produced, circulate and acquire meaning. 
She also has a much anticipated new book coming out with Duke University Press, I think later this year even. It's out now. Oh, it's out now, it's out now. Uh, on monumental statues, the kind that have been made in the landscape since the, since the 1990s in post-liberalization India, and maybe we'll hear more about that later. Dainita, I would say Kadri, why don't you unmute yourself as well? Um, I know, uh, so just to start off a little bit uh, with your development as an artist, um, perhaps you can just say a few words about where photographic practice started for you and what role this image played as a kind of pivotal or transformational moment. I know you're sick of this image, but I'm gonna force you to talk about it anyway. <laughs> this will always be a very, very important photograph for me because it was, where the shift happened in my head from always editing with a series in mind to realizing that I could edit with an emotion. And that emotion was go away closer, this impossible love story that happens between mother and child, husband and wife, uh, lovers, you know, can't live with you, can't live without you. And when I made that photograph, I also had a deja vu. I knew that I had photographed with that emotion, but I had just not shown those photographs because they didn't fit into any series that I was being asked to work on or wanted to work on. And so Go Away Closer was composed out of all what I used to call my sides. You know, the pictures you sort of take by the way because you can't help it, but they're not really part of any project that you're working on. So this image I love the image, but it was also such an important moment for me to such a big shift happened uh, from realizing that I could edit with an emotion that finally went on to developing an ear for editing, that I could edit with sound as well. But it really all started from this image. And this is, and you've called this your poppy image. So what's going on in here? Well, it's you, it's me, we are back from school, we are hungry, we are tired. Uh, mother's not at home or she doesn't have food ready. You know, lots of things, it's whatever you want to make of it. Now, one of the early shifts in your work was really taking your camera and shifting it from what could be thought of as kind of an exterior focused, you know, journalistic engagement to one that was really about uh, personal connections and friends and family. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that I am very tired about talking about mm -hmm. because that is like a dilemma in photography. I don't think anyone has any, none of us have a solution for it. You know, it's, it's unbearable to be a photojournalist working from my part of the world at a time when all people wanted to see from India was, you know, either something that was exotic or something that was disaster. And it was, it was very heartbreaking to feel that you were somehow becoming a pimp of, of that world. You became known as the India AIDS photographer, for example. And that was terrible. And I thought I would just break down if I continued. I couldn't deal with it. I know many people have found ways to engage with it, but at that time I couldn't. And so the only thing I could think of doing was to photograph all the families of my friends. And I remember at that time, Dipali, this was mid nineties, early nineties, thinking to myself that if at the end of my life, 300 homes in India have my photographs hanging in them, then that is exhibition enough for me. I never dreamt that all of this would happen and you know, I would make my own museums and then museums would want my museums, none of this, existed but somehow I knew from the start that I had to find my own with photography that the pre-existing forms were just I couldn't cope with them it was it was too it was it was a disaster to you know to, to work in those areas and I just thought I had to be an activist what was I doing there as a photographer and that's when I started to photograph families and then in that process chanced upon the poppy moment, maybe 15 years later. Just moving on, this is um, another photograph um, in that um, category of close family and friends. Um, 
I personally love this image quite a bit. Um, uh, there's a lot to say, but I think the point just to make in this one is how uh, in, in your images of people, these aren't that kind of ideal posed moment, but in fact, those moments when someone falls outside of the pose that exhales from that moment of catching the breath, you know, when the camera clicks, when the hair falls a little bit out of place, when the carpet is a, a slightly ruffled, you know, and not perfectly straight. Uh, there's something about that moment that's always attracted you. That's right, because, you know, who likes being photographed unless you're a movie star? And we all have a certain guard with the camera. And it takes a while to relax into the exhale of the pose, you know? Like, is it the exhale or is it the pause between the inhale and the exhale? It takes time. And then after all the posing has been done and the dramas have been played out on both sides, there comes a time when one just sort of lets go. And I think that's what happened in this picture. But to see it now, I have to tell you another story. And this is what fascinates me about photography, that you look at it as a photograph. And when I tell you, that in 1984, when Delhi was burning and all the Sikh houses in our neighborhood were being uh, burnt and everyone was being yeah, burnt alive, uh, Mr. Bidgley, and this is Mrs. Bidgley, so her husband uh, sheltered us in his house for five days. So we're alive because of these wonderful neighbors. And I think of that at this time, you know, because we are all also in a time again where it's really about community support. Uh, we're all looking out for each other. It's not, there is not uh, a government uh, support in place as yet. I don't know if it will come, but I feel so grateful to this, to this house, to the gentleman who made this house, who saved all our lives, my mother and her four daughters. And so there's this incredible backstory to the archive, you know? Um, mm. And sometimes I wonder if I made privacy again and if I just wrote the backstory to all of these images because they're all so potent. And that again, I guess, is a dilemma of photography and all the secrets that the photographer holds on to. I think well, if I might step in yeah. here, I just, I feel it might be useful for the audience to Here's something, if Dayanita, I might share something that you said to me the other day, which is that something like the photograph is a trace of a relationship, right? It's, you know, so the point is not the image. The point is the relationship from which the image emerges. And you described very beautifully the way that the Hasselblad and shooting with the Hasselblad in particular um, enables a certain kind of intimacy with your subject that, you know, like uh, lots of theories of photography talk about the objectifying gaze of the camera, but this is quite the opposite. Do you wanna expand a bit on that? Yeah, sure. I, I always feel that the true uh, portrait should have been on a video camera that was just left on in the corner because it's a whole theater and a relationship that is created in which the camera is a catalyst, but it's, that's not what it's about. The experience of the portrait is far greater than what any photograph can capture. So in a way it's connected to also to what I was saying before that we don't know the rest of the story. We know what the camera uh, records and which is the trace of this relationship. Thanks for reminding me about that. But the difference was, and this is not a Hasselblad picture, but when I was using the Hasselblad, I used to photograph from my belly. And so my legs were the tripod and I would stick the camera into my belly. And so not only did that mean that the camera was in, in tune with my breath. It meant that I had, I never lost eye contact with the people I was photographing. So there was no machine that was in the way. They were not looking at a camera, they were looking into my eyes and I was returning that gaze. And so 
it didn't even matter whether I was photographing after a point because the relationship became quite intense because by this time in Mrs. Bitchley's photograph, you know, the children had left and uh, it was just her and me. The session was actually over. And, but we had connected and everybody else got bored or distracted because these sessions would take a long time. And then this photograph appeared and it was only last week because of how Delhi was burning again that I was posting about Mr. Bidgley to talk about uh, the relationship behind this photograph. Right. And I think there it's very, again, very pertinent that these are photographs of friends and friends of friends, people yes. who you know, right? And that's, that's what enables the, the, uh, your access to this kind of private space, right? Um, it's, it's, and you can feel that difference in, I mean, again, whether or not it's the Hasselblad, you can see in Mrs. Bidgley's expression, right? That, that there is a relationship there. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. I think because of the situation, it's a little difficult now to look at this photograph. But yes, let's look at the. Yeah. Um, certainly, those those images of intimacy with people um, are are a, a big part of your archive. But in some ways, this sense of intimacy continues with images that you've created. Uh, that aren't necessarily people, but are objects that have personalities. And also the sense of the sequencing that you started to do with your images where they were not never just the single image that they were part of a dialogue that could change depending on which image was in the sequence. So this is an example uh, just sharing with people um, of a vintage printing press uh, that you did um, and another example is of these chairs and beds. And there is an intimacy here. There's one could even argue uh, people in these images. Um, uh, this is something, uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I was never ever comfortable with the idea of a single print. And it may have to do with the fact that uh, when I was starting to photograph, we made contact sheets and I continued making contact sheets of all my images. And often, well, I would say 90% of my archive remained in the contact sheet. I didn't see it as prints because prints were only made when you had to uh, give prints for a magazine or a exhibition. You didn't just make prints to look at how an image looks. That was too much of a luxury. So I was used to seeing photographs in grids of 12 or 36 because a film roll had 36 images. And so you had six rows of six images each. So I was used to reading images top to bottom, left to right, diagonally. They all existed together. And then gradually, as I came into the art world, I realized that there was this focus on a single image and the choice of material for that one image. And for me, it was I was always uncomfortable with that. I wanted the whole sequence there. I wanted the whole symphony, so much so that when I had an exhibition of the poppy image of the Go Away Closer prints, I wanted to make a slit in the frame and slip the Go Away Closer book behind the print, just so that if you did acquire a print, you would know that it is just one note from an entire symphony. And of course that was not okay. And I was you know, much younger then and I didn't have the confidence to say, no, 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 but it's very important that the work stays together. But then I did find a form that allowed me to keep that work together. But to come back to the idea of sequencing, I feel that photography really is raw material. It doesn't you know, it's good if it's good raw material, but it's just raw material. And I would say about 80% of my work is the editing and the sequencing. And it's in that process that the form emerges. So 
the image is just the starting point. It doesn't really exist in isolation for me. It's part of a sequence. It's part of an architecture. It's part of a symphony. I don't want to give you staccato notes. And that took a long while to find a form for that kind of work because, you know, when you're younger, you think uh, people who are older will know better, people who are in America will know better, they have a longer history in New York with showing photography in institutions and galleries. And I looked and I looked and I didn't find. And that's when I realized that I'll have to come up with my own systems. And, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to work with, um, with a wonderful gallerist who really supported me instead of telling me, no, this is not how photography is shown, who was very supportive of my museums and you know, last year, two years ago, I had an exhibition in her gallery and in the basement, I turned it into a pop-up bookshop. So I've been very, very fortunate with both the publisher I work with and the gallerist I work with that have allowed me to really take on what I see as the limitations of photography. Um, and the biggest limitation of photography for me is the photographers and the photo curators. It's like a status quo that everybody wants to um, maintain. And it makes me very uncomfortable because I know photography is vast and um, I want to open that up. I want to open that space, at least for myself. Patri, did you want to say anything on that? No, I mean, so just again for the audience, so would you say that the, the that contact print logic is what drives you towards the book making. And then that continues to unfold. I mean, literally and metaphorically, the books unfold into the museum, right? Because, you know, you, many of you must know that Danita makes these, um, these books. I'll just go to this that, here. Oh, there, there you go. Yeah, yeah, that fold out into sort of mini museums. So it's really a bit, sort of seamless transition from the contact print to the book, to the book museum, and then the museum museum, right? Yes, you're absolutely right, Kadri. I, I think if I hadn't made all those contact sheets and kept my work in contact sheets, a lot of this would not have happened because the contact sheets anyway forced me to think in a sequence, no? because there might be a photograph of my roommate from NID and next to it is an image of Zaki Hussain who I was photographing and 10 frames later there might be my friends in Bombay in whose house I used to live in, my Bombay family, like my Calcutta family. So in my contact sheets, all these worlds coexisted and seamlessly actually, because I was the same person, it was just the structures of photography that told me you have to work in a series. You have to give things in neat little boxes. And by the time I got to go way close, I realized there are other ways to put the work out there. It doesn't have to be these series, but certainly the contact sheets um, absolutely informed the idea of the book that became the museum that again became the book. And, and it's, sorry. Mm. I was just going to say, and I thank the economy of the, of the contact sheet, you know, the fact that we couldn't afford to make endless amounts of prints. So we had to just look at our work in contact sheets. And that made my relationship perhaps with photography different than other photographers in the world, because it's, it was too much of a luxury to just make prints, just to see how an image looked. I think I was lucky enough that I could make contact sheets. So I was just going to say, actually, that it, it's so it's partly about sequencing, but it's also somewhere about scale, right? I mean, the fact is that we were looking at images at that tiny scale. So you were unafraid to put them in a book, to put them in a little, you know, portable museum like this rather than the big sort of handsome gallery blow up, right? So yes. I think that that plays into it as well. And it, it goes back to economy, 
right? The, the thing of keeping things small, but then that makes them accessible. Absolutely, Kadri, you're so right. It goes back to the economy and yes, the contact sheet. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. My God, I can't imagine what it would be like had I not had the years of contact sheet. And it's only last year that, that I've seen maybe 70% of my work uh, out, you know, in a larger contact sheet because I scanned my contact sheet so I could look at them on the screen. But until then, I was used to seeing everything very small. And these books actually, the one on the screen is literally made from cutting up my medium format contact sheets and pasting them into these books. And the accessibility is key to me. I mean, you know, photography and photo, people who study photography, people who practice photography, think so much about the image, but, but that's just one part of it. To me, there's an equal part, which is the dissemination, which is the book, which is the calendar, which is all the forms that one finds for the images. And how come there is not as much of an emphasis on that? It surprises me because that's something that is so unique to photography. And especially now that we all have a scan as a starting point. So who's to say what the original is? Is the print the original? Is the calendar the original? Is the book the original? It's, if I'm the artist, then it's for me to say. So there are, there's so much shifting in photography and yet I feel, um, I feel it's, it's vast, it can be even vaster and yet we are somehow held back by photography. Oh, well, sorry, I'm laughing because somebody has just written in the chat that they don't know what contact sheets are. So this is, this is the pre-digital uh, generation. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so in the days when one had film, I'm trying to see if I can have something here. I don't. Uh, they're upstairs. You, you had a roll of film, which had, uh, depending on 35 mm film, had 36 negatives after they were produced, after they were processed. So you process the film, you got the negatives. It was a long strip of film. You cut it up and you put it on a light box and you put a paper on top so you had a uh, an image of all, all the negatives together you had a positive of 36 negatives if that makes sense so that's how you saw the image so i hope that explains so you, what you the got a sense of is. what you had photographed right i mean it because otherwise you're just like looking at these strips of cellulose in negative this really? Interestingly, I must add, and I can actually show it to you. Oh, I don't mm. know if my video is working actually. So, is my video working? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wait. Okay, let me show you something. <laughs> Maybe I'll just go through the rest of these slides so people also who are not familiar with her work can get a sense of how these photographs become sequences, become objects. Um, that are then able to be displayed in a home, changed around. Here is an example of a pop-up shop. Uh, I think this is the one in New York, wasn't it, Dianita? Uh, the one on the left is in Baroda, on the right is in Berlin. And then other kinds of objects that you've created as well. This is the Poti box, which actually I have here too which was essentially a, a wooden frame that contains a set of prints that one can change. So whether it's sitting on a desk or on a wall, uh, this is something that whoever has the uh, book or the object can change up and curate uh, the exhibition as they see fit. And I think these are my own images from when that uh, a different one box of shedding was in Kochi. So let's just stick with that. Yeah, please, uh, if you wanted to share about the contact sheets. I think one of the things that I love about uh, uh, something that you've said in the past, which is something that about how um, the book is the museum and the museum show is 
the book on the wall. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, I think in the book, that's the book is the book is my that's my language, that's my form, and the exhibitions come out of the books. So even for this retrospective next year, even though you know we're obviously not going to make books for the retrospective, but I have to think in the book, I have to think in the chapter. And that's why I practice, I try to share with people the idea of book building. That book building. Building is just a way of dealing with one's photography. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you will make a book at the end of it. But it's, it's that editing and sequencing and weeding out and finding the form that happens through the exercise that I call book building. Does that make sense? Even if there's no book at the end of it. So it's the process I go through for everything. I just wanted to say that even though I now photograph in digital, I still make these contact sheets, these 12 images on a page. Interesting. Because that's a way of looking at work. And so I make two sets of these simple spiral bound notebooks and I can travel with them. You know, so I have a pile sitting there. It gets a little heavy now because there's 15 of them, but I have another set in Goa so I can refer to that when I'm there because my archive is really my contact sheet. That is the most valuable thing in it. And, you know, we were talking about my will in the film. And that's the other thing that I don't, it's not about keeping the negatives. I might even destroy the negatives. But the idea is that the contact sheets must remain because that is my primary form. And so I just wanted to show you this to say the contact sheet maybe sound like an old idea but I even use it in the digital situation, that it's not just analog. And it's something that I would recommend to people to make a diary of all your work and you see the connections between things in a way that you can't see on the computer because with digital photography, you have a numbering problem. And so you have to make these folders for things and then things get stuck in that folder and you can't shuffle them around. You don't see the connections between something you did 20 years ago and something you did today. So this whole practice, the rigor of book building is crucial to what I do. And it's something I would propose to anyone who works with images uh, to really take that on and develop working with the images, but equally, if not more importantly, to think of the dissemination. I feel we are doing photography a huge disservice when we sort of stop at the even the form of it you know um there's this the best aspect in a way is the dissemination that's the most thrilling thing and, and actually let's talk about that because the dissemination part i think is you know uh, is another level of kind of the innovativeness of your practice because um you know, you've worked with Steidel, but you've also established your own publishing um, project, one could say, called Spontaneous Books, that I think you describe as the opportunity to publish what you want, when you want on a moment's notice or, or something like that. So there's there's this, and then there's this issue of, of dissemination and then the circulation that's attached to that. And so, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And, and then I'd, maybe I'd pull Kadri in for that as well, because that connects so much with your work as uh, Kadri as well. You know, this goes back to something Kadri had mentioned earlier, that the idea of the family is, is very important to my work. So even though I may not be photographing families, the homes of the families are very important to me. And a few days ago I was getting into this dark hole with everything that was happening I mean it's not how can one not get into that hole and I thought you know one it's like a game of dice you don't know who's going to go when because it's it's like a fire in the city and you don't know when it's going to come your way and I I thought to myself what is it that I'm okay with and the thing that really really made me feel happy is the fact that my work is in your house. My work is in Kajri's house. 
these little boxes, center letter and museum bhavan. You know, in the beginning when I made center letter, people said, oh, that's so cute, that's sweet. It's not cute. It's 17 exhibitions of my work that exist in your house. Dipali, if you have two of my boxes, you know, you have 30 times 3,900 combinations to play with my work. So I must say that my consolation was that my work was not in, way, in vain, that it did exist in the homes. And you have to believe me, I didn't think of the museums at that time. I didn't think about, even though it's of course a huge honor to be in MoMA, to be at the Tate, of course, but something about being in people's domestic space, something about my family portrait hanging in their home, along with in the days, early days when people used to have political leaders on their walls, um, you know, there's, there's something connected to being in the domestic space, being facilitated by families. In fact, so much of my work, the true patrons of my work are the families whose homes I used to stay in. I have a Bombay family and I have a Calcutta family. The Calcutta family extends over three generations. I can walk into their homes at any time, stay for as long as I like, um, and then they introduce me to friends. It's, it's just the way the work builds. And so it doesn't surprise me now that even though, you know, it was like, what happens if I drop dead in a week? And it's like, okay, Steidel has all the PDFs of my books. So the books can still be printed. And all these people in whose homes I have sort of planted my archive, the people who have these boxes. Um, and I was fine, it was okay. And then I said, okay, I can't go further in this space. I'm gonna work. I'm really going to work and I'm going to do the talks and I'm gonna talk about everything I want to say about photography, about dissemination. And then, you know, we'll see, we'll see who remains. And, but I know that my books are there. And as far as prints and books are concerned, um, you know, provided we use the right paper, um, a book remains closed. So a book is as archival as a print. So, you know, it's, it's become quite clear to me in these past weeks that actually what I thought I was doing as a way of creating my, a space for my ideas within photography is actually, is actually much more than that. It is, it is my life's work that I've planted in your house. And so it's not up to one museum. It's not up to one collector. It's, you know, at least 3000 homes in the world have my museum bhavan. And that's a lot because then they have nine exhibitions of my work. They also have sent a letter. Then they have 17 exhibitions of my work. And I'm, I don't know what it means, but it gave me a lot of comfort that all this work has found home in homes. That was, that was the thing that gave me solace, really. Um, I'm, I'm struck by this exponential increase um, quality about it, the, the, the sort of times, times this and times that. There's something very basic to the logic of photography itself, to this idea of this exponential increase in dissemination, but I'll throw it over to Kadri, who I think um, probably has lots to say about this issue. <laughs> lots to say, but I mean, I think what I will just tease out is one thing that we haven't really spoken about so far. I mean, we've talked about, I mean, the, the way I see it, what we were saying about photography being for Dayanita about social relations. We've seen how that played out at the moment of producing the photograph, right? If it's, you know, whether Hasselblad or not, it's, it's about who you're photographing and your relationship with them. So the photograph just becomes a trace of that. We've talked about it in the space of exhibitions where you know there is the formal museum space but you've also sort of created a way to have museums in homes so you've you've bridged that public private divide there what is also very intriguing which perhaps the audience may not know that much about is the role of in the 
the, that moment of circulation, right? When you say it gets planted in your house. Now, how does that happen? And this, this goes to what you were saying about numbers, Deepali. I, there's an interesting kind of play that you do between the gift, the logic of the gift and, and commerce which you embrace in a very interesting way. And that I think, you know, that actually is quite disturbing to some because, you know, we have this very sort of modernist idea of art as a pure autonomous space free of commerce. But you have tapped into traditions that, you know, we grew up with in India of commerce being a social relation, right? You go in to a sari shop and the guy brings you tea and drapes the sari over himself and, you know, asks after your family, etc. right? So it's as though some of your own practices of circulation saying to the publisher, I want 40 of these or 42, however, I mean, you can tell us about it. So many have to go to friends or they have to be gifts or, so, so tell us a bit about that engineering that you do with <laughs> the gift and the commodity and, you know, blurring the lines between them. Well, it's interesting that you brought up the sari shop because I think that is the, that is my secret inspiration for a lot of uh, what I've gone on to do. I remember going with my mother to uh, the sari shops in Karolbag, Ushnatmal, or something like that. And these men would drape the saris onto them. Um, and, you know, they would sort of seduce you into buying the work. Uh, and it was a work, but yeah. it required a lot of engagement. So the more cups of tea you had, the better the material would be that came out. And it is for this reason that even when I'm in Calcutta and I say to my friend Nandita, my Calcutta family, that, you know, give me a sari because I want to collect saris from all my friends and I want to have a sari museum with each with, with the stains. And, and, and she said, I can't, I'll buy you a sari, but I can't give you one because sari is a story. I went to that village and bought it from that weaver, this shop, I was with so-and-so. And I think that started to make me realize that even the book objects, there had to be, there had to be this something around them. It couldn't, you couldn't just order it on Amazon. You had to come to Kochi, you had to come to Baroda mm. and you could only buy one. So it didn't, you know, you could be the wealthiest collector, but you couldn't just make a Christmas gift out of all my book objects. At most you could get two if I knew you or if you told me you were buying it for your children and you happen to have two. If you had three children, I might allow you three. So this whole sort of drama was all for you to have a story with which you have acquired this work. And even though you paid me $300 for the box, Dipali, I still feel I have given you a gift. So now the two sort of get all confused because I must take money from you. I think for the first time there was someone a little few weeks ago who took, took their time paying me and it really annoyed me because I said, you don't get it. This, this money is a token for what I'm giving to you. Um, and you know, and she said, talk to my accountant. And I said, you, you've, you, you've just not understood what it's about. And so maybe I haven't been able to explain to people enough that it's there too, it's like an experience. I want you to remember where you bought it. I want you to remember how you had to run to the ATM to get money because I didn't, I wanted at that point cash because I didn't have a machine. And you know, there was no credit. You just, you had to give me the money and it would embarrass my gallerist very much because I wanted to actually have money physically in my pockets, you know? I wanted the pockets to be full of money of these book objects with which then I would, have, would buy a gold bangle. And so my dream was that at the end of my life, which may now be sooner than I think, I should have gold bangles from here to here, you know? Because this would then be 
the economy of the book object that I'm after. What do I want? I want the book to be a sustainable form. I want mm. photographers to be able to earn from making books. Right now, nobody earns money from making books. You, you get a lot of appreciation, but you don't earn money. So my book object uh, is a way of creating the space between the art gallery and the publishing house where it'll have a different level of collectors, a different level of commerce, but it, it's very tied into the experience of acquiring it, like the sari shop. I love the image how your hand will be full of, your arm will be full of bangles, each one representing the proceeds from one of your book projects. Yeah. <laughs> I want to um, make sure we get a chance to talk about your social media engagement also, Dianita, because that to me is part of that practice. And there's a few questions I'm just seeing on the Q&A uh, function that, that addresses that. Just want to show people uh, who haven't been on your, your um, Instagram handle yet, just a few images of, of what that looks like. So just going back. Um, so Dianita's Instagram page, this is a screenshot from a few months ago. So it's probably quite different now. And she's posted amongst still images, moving images. And I think I, this actually might work a little bit. Maybe not. Anyway, it's a, a moving image. Um, and then also what are basically, um, you know, uh, your own thought process uh, kind of visualized as text, I think, uh, on what it means to work with an archive. What does it mean to be a photographer today? What is a photograph? What is not a photograph? Image plus form plus dissemination. Photography exceeds the image and always has. It is what you know some scholars are calling an event um, that always has included that interaction um, and that involves you know, uh, the subject, a, uh, the photographer, the relationship between them, and then the imagined viewer or viewers that have yet to come in, in a future space. Um, I, I want you to talk about that. <laughs> what are you doing with your Instagram? How, what, do you, what do you feel like? What role do you feel it plays for you? Instagram has really freed me because I have, I'm not, I'm certainly not an academic, so I'm not able to create um, large arguments ag around my idea, but by ideas, but by now I know that what I have to say has some significance. And, you know, I haven't met so many people uh, that I can have that kind of conversation with. So I thought, great, let me just put it out on Instagram. And it started with, a few posts and then you know I have bursts of clarity and usually happens in my yoga class and so after my yoga uh, I have this <laughs> moment of clarity and I put it on Instagram and now Steigl is going to make a book out of those as well from all these Instagram stories because they really allow me to say the things that I want to say it's like imagine waking up one morning and realizing every image in my archive is a hyperlink and now by the time I would get through to an art historian friend, make an appointment to discuss it with them, for them to then take it in and think about it, it's, it's a much longer process. So I started to put these out on Instagram and lo and behold, the biggest supporters of this have been photo curators. <laughs> so it's fantastic. You know, I've, I've reached just the people that I wanted to have provoke this conversation with. And um, so the Instagram has gone really well for the texts I can keep putting out. Um, and equally, I think what it's done is it's also made my mother into a bit of a Instagram star because now people write That's to me and everyone's writing everywhere. How is your mother? How is your mother? And it's like, you know, <laughs> Hello, <laughs> everybody wants to know how my mother is doing. Uh, please give her our love. And now she's busy, my mother's busy coloring my black and white prints. I mean, who on this earth would have the courage to put fluorescent markers on my prints? 
but that is what my mother is doing and doing a beautiful job. And so now there's an Instagram diary being created of these photographs. So at one level, I put things that are very intimate as in family work. And then I put these, some of them I thought are quite significant texts about photography. Like the one that I like a lot, which is a recent one, is a book is a, a, book is a conversation with a stranger in the future. And how nice to be able to just put it out there. And then people can take it and do what they like. They can trash it. They can say this is nonsense. It's fine. I got to say things the way I wanted to say them. So Instagram has been extremely liberating. But I don't put my work on it as in if I'm working on something. Because Instagram also simplifies the image too much. And I think there's a concern I know Instagram will throw up its own school of photography and it already does. But if there are certain complexities that you're looking for, then the Instagram space being backlit is a bit of a problem. And it's also for the way that you scroll through it. You know, mm. I feel that if it was somehow left to right, you would engage differently, but this is a different movement. Um, so yeah, I think personally for me, Instagram has been fantastic. Uh, for photography, I'm, I'm concerned about what it does to the complexity that we all love in the image, no? Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Kadri, or say anything about it? I want to move to a few pit questions from the Yeah, I think too, the audience has, is questions. eager and <laughs> has lots uh, of questions. There's quite a bit of, yeah, there's quite a bit of engagement that's come in. I'm just going to pick a few. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not being so organized to go front to back, but um, uh, this is sort of connected. Um, uh, one of our um, listeners, Merle Cole asks, I noticed that you often use a square aspect ratio in your photos, while many are going to uh, wide aspect ratios for digital screens. Uh, so why is that? Is that because you share much of your work in print? Or do, is that because you share much of your work on social media in particular formats? So that structure. Well, I think I was very drawn to the square format because it allowed me to escape the context. You know, we're talking about the 90s where the image was, especially from this part of the world, the context was the main thing. And I was not interested in always having to give the context. That was the where and the when was such a burden for photography. So that's how I moved to the square because it just allowed me to leave the sides out and I could focus more. And then lo and behold, Instagram started uh, in a square format as well. So I thought that's great. That's a seamless transition for me. So the square really worked out very well for me. Um, someone else also asked about um, talk if you could talk a little bit more about your editing process, editing and sequencing process. That is something that we could talk all night about because it is that's that's the work. That's everything. It's like asking me about my life because my work is my <laughs> life. Um, the editing it goes back again actually to the contact sheets. So until I have this, there's no editing possible. Then these prints are cut up or I make little prints and I have bundles of prints that I travel with in these little portlies, you know, because you never know where you might want to edit. It could be on a plane in the days we used to travel. It could be in a friend's house. Hotel rooms are great because if you have a double bed, then that's a great big surface. So basically for editing, you need a bunch of prints, hundreds of prints and a large table. And you have to keep putting them out on the table and you have to let the images speak. You have to listen to the images and what they want to be rather than saying, I'm going to make something about Delhi because of this is this. No, you have to just put the work out there and you have to see what emerges out of it. And often I do that by, I might take this image of Mona as a starting point. And then literally from somewhere in this package, I might take an image 
of my mother and my niece and my sister. And then, so there's one selection that's happened from the contact sheets. Then there's another selection that happens from the prints. And then slowly a sequence starts to build. And I think when the sequence starts to come in, a lot of work is shared. You have to be ruthless with yourself, like you have to be in text. And it's like paring down, reducing, reducing. And then finally to have the courage to say, actually, you know what? It's just this one picture. I'm not going to make a book out of it, but that photograph is enough. Um, and then you put it away and then you say, wait a minute, I have that, but look, here is another couple in another kind of domestic situation. And maybe, I mean, I'm just randomly picking it up, but maybe there's another one, you know? This is, I mean, I, this is not in any order. I'm just picking these things up as I see them. And then it slowly starts to build. And then I sort of take, make photocopies and paste them back to back or cut them. It has to be done with the hands. And I think the mistake often we make with photo books now is that we try to make them on the screen. And the problem is that finally they're meant to be a tactile object, no? So I can sort of smell a photo book that has been made on the screen and I feel my heart goes out to the photographer who gets their first copy from the printing press because of course it's too late then, whether it's just the weight of the paper or the feel of the paper or the sound that it makes when it falls and much more serious things as well, not to say that these are not serious. So then I start to make these dummies these maquettes and then leave them and come back to them. But at, at every point to be ready to dismantle, to build and break, to build and break, to not, to not get attached to the edit, to not even be attached to the images because that's not what it's about. It's not about you. So at a certain point you have to let go of the image even, you let go of yourself and you let go of the images and then you have to see what is this book trying to be? What is the book doing? And what serves the book and what doesn't serve the book? And then it's much easier to out, 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 out. Um, but it's, yeah, it's having the courage to fail every time, you know, hmm. and I'll do it again and again. And then you come to a moment where you know that this is right. But it's, it's a long process. I mean, editing Museum of Chance took me two years because the edit had to work in any sequence. So editing is different for a book. In a way, you could say it's much easier. But editing for a structure where a future curator is going to make their own story out of it, then everything has to work together. Blindly, you, sh you should be able to say fifth image from there and 78th image from there and I want to put them together and they should work. Hmm. Um, Jan asks, um, I feel we all photograph with our eyes constantly, but stop and store one most important point and save it in our memory. Does that make sense to you as an artist? Uh, could you say that again? Um, so Jan says, I feel we all photograph with our eyes constantly, but stop and store one moment, most important point, and save it in our memory. Does that make sense to you as an artist? I'm, I don't completely understand, but I do often say to people that try to breathe before you photograph, like take a mm. deep breath, just don't just go, you know, endlessly with the button. Um, it's, 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 photography is too much instant gratification. And I think we need to slow down and we need to breathe. And we need to sometimes say, I'm gonna take one image today, that's it. Or I'm gonna take three images, you know, like we did when we had film and you had one roll of film and you had to make it last the whole month because that's all you could afford. And no wonder my contact sheets are so rich because there's a lot of material in them. So I think this sort of breathing for, before photographing could be a wonderful way of thinking of photography. And now the next question would be, 
Do you make the image on the inhale or the exhale? Because I think that's different too. And it could be that you make the image on the pause in between, but it's something to think about the Pali because a photograph is about holding your breath. No, when you want to take a long exposure, you have to be steady and you do that by holding your breath. And I am saying, no, you must, you don't hold it in. You sort of take it after the exhale. But regardless of that, that's an aside. The breathing, you have to breathe and then photograph. So I don't understand about taking photos with the eyes because I don't, I don't, I don't photograph like that. So I'm a little confused about the question. But I mean, I I given... this, this goes back to the way, you know, in the West, photography is thought of. So, or in our photographic theory, uh, it's pho photography has been associated so much with vision and the eyes. Whereas mm -hmm. what we're hearing from you is that partly it's about the photographers and the subject's entire body. You know, you're talking about the Hasselblad against your, your belly and the dance that you do. And then the breath that choreographs the, the process of photography, right? But there's also a kind of world of um, materiality that you've spoken about, right? That where in the edit, the, the photograph itself, the image itself as an object or the book as an object is playing a part, right? Is an agent as we might call it, right? In the process. So again, this is not about a visual, yeah. uh, a, a solely visual relationship. It is tactile, it is embodied, it is, you know, uh, and, and it is multi-sided, right? It's not just the photographer doing something, but the photographer allowing the image to work on them and vice versa. I mean, it, what you're saying reminds me of Gerhard Richter once saying, um, I have to, the painting has to tell me what it wants. Exactly. I didn't know he'd said that, but exactly that. The images have to tell you what they want to be. And you cannot interfere in that. And you cannot let an editor or a curator interfere in that. And you have to, have to, you have to be true to them because it, it's like the muse, you know, you can't just, they're not endlessly there waiting to be seen. If you don't, if you don't engage with them, if you don't learn to listen to the images, I tell people, I now have an ear for images. So I can listen to the images and I can see what kind of a sequence this is becoming. And I often even give it a tone, Kajri. Like this is going to be, you know, I won't start singing now, but I have a sort of yeah, tone. Yeah. Of so no, it's not about just seeing. That's, right. no, no, no. You've already no. spoken, you've spoken about sound, you've spoken about smell, the smell of, of a book, right? So, so it is such a multi-sensory experience. And next time you come to an exhibition of mine where my museums are, there will be the smell of teak wood and linseed oil. Right. So right. Th there's, there's, there's just so many layers. And you know the smell of a fresh book. I mean, the first thing I do, in fact, when I get a book from Steidl is I open it and I smell it because I love that uh, smell of fresh ink, you know, when it hasn't fully dried. And Steidl has even made a perfume of that smell because obviously oh. he's not crazy about all this as I oh, am. Oh, I want it. <laughs> all paper fashion. Lovely. The smell of the book. And you know the sound of the paper. I mean, yeah. even when you get a book, um, the first thing you do is you don't really... So I would open the book and I would smell it. But before that, I feel it. You feel it. So I listen yeah. to the sound of that. So if it has a leatherite cover, if it has paper, you know, all this is happening before I've even seen the images. Right. There's, there's a whole lot of, yeah, it's all the senses are involved. So no, it's not about the eyes. I, I think that that's a wonderful um, point to stop on. Um, 
and uh, want to just thank both of you, Dianita and Kajri, for being total pros, for being flexible <laughs> uh, in terms of the session, for having a fulsome conversation anyway. Uh, and thank you to our audience as well. Thank you for your patience as we dealt with the technical issues at the beginning and for uh, many of you for sticking it through with us. Um, there are other programs uh, that will be uh, going on um, through the ROM Connects series. Uh, please check back on the ROM's website to find out what those are and register for those. I wish everybody a good night, a good afternoon, um, and probably a late morning, depending on where you are in your world. Um, and um, thank you for joining us so much.